Thank, thank you, Keith. Now, we've, we've got time for some questions, if anybody wants to ask questions. But please remember, wait until the microphone reaches you, because it's a big room, and people won't be able to hear you unless you have the microphone. OK, this gentleman here was first. Oh. Chairman, advancing secularism and human rights requires, above all, education. And I despair. You take one simple example. Uh, in, in America, where, which I love, I'm very mid-Atlantic, that evil man, Senator Cruz, a Canadian senator from Texas, calls for restoration of Bible marriage. Now, somebody said that the that the atheists like ourselves know the Bible much better than people like Senator Cruz because we know that traditional Bible marriage is polygamous plus as many sex slaves as you can afford, including the ladies in the household of your wife. And you see in America, and you see similar things here, People who haven't got the faintest idea how lucky they are to live under the rule of law, people who couldn't even tell you what the law of contract is and why it's vital to their own uh, freedom. Uh, and I hope the NSS will be concentrating as much as anything else, and there's so many things we could be doing, on educating those who are not up to taking sensible decisions with it current level of learning. I would, wouldn't mind um, making them questions rather than statements. Um, yes, Dan, the gentleman here. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dan Bai, I'm chair of DW, DW Foot & Co, publishers of The Freethinker. Um, Brexit, is that good or bad for secularism and human rights? That would be my question. Maybe you'd like to answer that, Keith. Uh, well, maybe the panel. Yeah. Uh, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to give my view um, and defer to, to anyone else on the panel. Um, I, I'm very worried about uh, several things that are associated with this. Uh, one is that uh, there was a very good case made that given that the United King doesn't, Kingdom doesn't have a written constitution, that it is could be argued that it was almost justified to stay in the European Union to have the benefit of the uh, effective uh, constitution that came with that, for example, the EU fundamental rights. Um, the NSS doesn't have a formal position on Brexit um, in the same way that it doesn't have a formal position on party political affiliation, but certainly there are human rights problems uh, associated with that and I would just add that I am horrified that the former Home Secretary now Prime Minister even contemplated the uh, UK's withdrawal uh, from the European Convention of Human Rights and I'm ashamed of that um, and uh, the implications not just for the UK but for the rest of Europe that, that the signal that that sends is something that I am ashamed that she has done. Okay, so Tamima, would you like to say anything about that? Um, just to add to that, it would have serious implications for the Good Friday Agreement if we were to withdraw from the European Convention of Human Rights. So it seems that no one has thought of the bigger picture and how this would affect Northern Ireland or the Republic of Ireland or any of the other, uh, well, the, the rest of the British Isles really. <coughs> Well, from, a, from a not being very specific, but it seems that on, on the European landscape and UK with its um, decision, UK's public decision on Brexit, is just an example of what um, the challenge is, uh, is um, lying ahead of us all. Um, is basically politics is not steering the society any longer, but social divisions are steering the, society, uh, the politics. And um, it, is, it became such a mess with also the reaction to the uncontrollable uh, global migration crisis that has led to, I believe, uh, Brexit uh, results in the, in the referendum in the UK. So unless we find um, the solutions um, to convince the host society 
um, who uh, to live on the living together idea around the same rules, which where the key is very much uh, lies in the secular values and identity. So um, it, it won't be possible because since the intervention to Iraq in 2003 with a claim to bring democracy, it returned to people with a flood of, uh, it returned to all of us with a flood of people. And Pandra's box keeps opening up. So as I said, I mean, I think this claim needs to end for those societies who doesn't want to live by this kind of Western style democracy and thus the West should stop, you know, sending troops for so-called mass destruction um, uh, weapons, uh, set, set, to stop um, troops going into other countries, even going into war to change regimes in proxy ways. That needs to stop as well, um, as a prevention for further migration moves, but also to get the houses cleaned, um, it needs to strictly establish that citizenship, which Tahmina also mentions in her pieces, opets, um, and citizenship also requires to obey by the rules. I mean, it brings also duties, um, and it needs to be um, uh, by the rules that we can only manage living together. And it will have some um, domino effect, of course, Brexit result in the UK, in the rest of the EU. Um, giving some kind of motivation and inspiration for those movements um, on the radical right, I'm, I'm afraid to say. Yeah. This gentleman here. Sorry, this, this lady here was where, sorry, where, where? Oh, right, okay, this lady here. Thank you very much. My name is Gona Said, and I'm part of a delegation from a Kurdistan Secular Center. Uh, really privileged to be here today. Uh, I've got two questions, if you allow me. One of them is for Ms. Shafak and the other one for Keith. Um, Ms. Shafak, if I didn't misunderstand you, towards the end of your um, speech, you said something about the West should stop, um, and in your words, societies uh, to bring democracy to societies decided to live by God-given commanders. Um, I think... Um, as I said, if I am not misunderstood, I think this is not fair on the societies that comes to the streets asking for bread, jobs, and a secular state. And that's happened in Baghdad just a few months ago. Many, many people take to the street demanding a secular state because they just fed up with um, these religious conflicts. Uh, that is the culture of the ruling uh, class in our countries. Um, the other one is you talked about a lot about culture, um, like the resistance from culture. And my question would be, whose culture is that? Whose culture in that society? Um, last year, I just bring one small example. Last year, as Kurdistan Secular Center, we ran a campaign on the street in a very small area populated by less than 5 million people, and that's Iraqi Kurdistan. Within 45 days on the street, 100,000 people signed up for a secular constitution for that region. And that's, to me, a culture of people wanting secularism, basically, as a solution for the conflicts, and they fed up with the lie they have. So I, I hope that you clarify on that point a little bit. Um, my second question is to Keith. I just, I'm really interested to know how much challenges or what are the challenges you are facing in your committee at the UN from uh, countries like Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Turkey as well, um, in terms of um, like UN policies and legislations um, towards religious freedom or freedom of speech, basically. Thanks. Thank okay. You. Would you like to go first, Shafak? Sure, of course. Um, I, I would like to, of course, clarify that point. I, I completely agree with you that the societies themselves should ask for this and should decide on their destiny. Um, what I'm saying is that with the military intervention back in 2003, opening up Pandora's box, just like Russian Matrushka dolls, is exactly this. First, the societies have to decide on their destiny, just like what you have referred to on the secular constitution. And then, but this, this shouldn't turn into a claim of bringing democracy, which is followed by military, sending military troops, which then um, 
without the right reading of cultural, ethnic, and religious fault lines in those lands, which is very sensitive already, um, which, is, which is on the basis of the society, and living together idea is where it is already difficult. So I hope this clarifies um, the question that you posed, and thank you so much for sharing your opinion um, on those remarks as well. Thank you. Okay. Keith? Well, we're going to be, to a degree, the new kids on the block um, in, in Geneva, uh, although we have done quite a bit of work, um, as you know, uh, particularly on child abuse, but on other issues too. Um, I th I, I'm something that I found extraordinarily depressing was the persistent report that you, the United Kingdom government was actually uh, in league with Saudi Arabia in some kind of dual deal that both of them, to help both of them get sufficient votes to get onto the, or remain on the Human Rights Council. I do hope that those reports are wrong, but I have to say they're very persistent. Um, I think the kind of thing that we do uh, and will continue to do is to try and find uh, governments who are receptive uh, to the kind of messages that we're giving. Canada is an obvious example. And actually inform them about areas of concern um, that we have come across. And sometimes that's quite a valuable role. We assume that everybody knows everything, but it's, it's amazing how uh, helpful you can be by actually being very, very uh, observant about, uh, about events that are going on, identifying trends, um, and uh, sending dossiers to, uh, to particular countries, uh, or indeed, other human rights activists within those countries who've got a greater amount of leverage. And we do work with a lot of other NGOs. Um, and that's perhaps our, our, our greatest way of, of achieving results. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. One of, one of the other things about the United Nations, of course, is the way that religious countries get together to thwart uh, progressive legislation. We've, we've heard of cases of Saudi Arabia allying with the Vatican to thwart women's rights issues. Um, this is something that really has to be challenged because it uh, it's, uh, affects more people than just their own constituencies. So, um, right, the next question. Um, I think this gentleman is next. The microphone's coming. My name is Barry Barclay and I'm president of Northeast Humanists in the UK. Um, two weeks ago, there was an article in the UK periodical The Economist, which was headed This Skeptic Isle. And it made the, it, it, it spent, a, it, there was a whole page article which uh, reminded people about the fall in number of people going to church and gave you know, many reasons uh, f uh, for looking again at British law. And in fact, it called for a national debate on the role of secularism, secularism in the UK. Now, I wonder whether the NSS has got any way of, of trying to promote that on, on the basis of this article, which must have been read by, by many people. Uh, is there any way in which a national debate could now be held because of the fall uh, of uh, attendance in churches and the fact that many churches are now up for sale? Thank you. Yeah. Um, that, that's really interesting. I mean, in the National Secular Society, we're constantly trying to provoke uh, debates about the place of religion in society. And if you remember, earlier this year, there was a, um, a committee called CORAB, which did it consultations all around the country about what the place of religion should be in society in these changed circumstances. And 
unfortunately, it was almost entirely uh, the work of religious people. Everybody on the committee, except for the British Humanist Association, was religious. And because of that, we didn't think that it was going to come up with anything very radical or very objective. So we didn't take part in it. And we have produced our own report, which you have got in your pack there, uh, about what we think the place of religion in British society should be. So we would like it to be a national debate, but unfortunately we've got a government at the moment that is not sympathetic and is unlikely to do anything that would cause a confrontation with religious bodies. It's only got a, a, a majority of, what is it, 16. Um, it's not going to uh, set off debates that are going to be divisive um, just at the moment. So we'll have to wait for that, but we keep pushing. Does anybody else want to say anything about that? Just yeah. to add that Keith and myself also uh, took part in the University of Warwick panel to suggest secular changes to the CORAB report. And when I was working at British Muslims for Secular Democracy, we had a number of innovative ways of promoting secularism within Muslim communities, such as inviting Manwa Ali, a former jihadist who's now reformed and become an outspoken advocate of secular democracy, to talk about secular democracy at Queen Mary University to an audience of Muslim students and to talk about how, how living in a secular democracy had enabled him to educate people on his religion without imposing it on them. So there are a number of innovative ways in which we can do this. Okay, <clears throat> I'm sorry, we're, we've now reached lunchtime and the lunch break is going to be 50 minutes, so if you could be back on time, that would be appreciated because we've got a fascinating um, speaker, uh, our keynote speaker, Jacques Berliner Blau, and that is going to be absolutely riveting. So please be back in 50 minutes' time. Thank you.